Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Northwest, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. My name is Vanessa Washington, and I will be your service associate for this morning. Unfortunately, according to the COVID Now website, we're back in the medium community risk level category. Therefore, our choir will be singing, but there will be no communal singing. Be, feel free to hum along or move around or stand up while they're singing. Today's sermon will be delivered by our very own Reverend Peter Gable, an ordained Presbyterian minister. We welcome him back into the pulpit with us. If you're a visitor online and would like us to stay in touch with you, um, you can fill out the visitor form in the chat box. If you're here with us in person, you can fill out a form in the atrium or talk to anyone you see. Please greet your neighbors with a welcome from wherever you are. Okay, Alex will start the prelude momentarily. Before he does, let us all take a deep breath. And settle into a time of worship.
We begin our service today with a land acknowledgement. This land, the hills, woods, and rivers is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabek Three Fires Confederacy, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and Potawatomi. The Northwest UU Congregation acknowledges the injustice of the theft of this land and the continuing presence despite attempts at the annihilation of the indigenous people of this place. And we pledge ourselves to justice and repair both with the land and its people. We light our chalice, the symbol of our faith, knowing this morning that many other Unitarian Universalists across the land and across the world are doing the same. We light this chalice with words by the Reverend Joan Javier Duval. Out of depths unknown, the spark of life ignites, and we are born, we enter a world, a universe, not of our making. Our lives unfold in mystery and wonder, questions abound for which there are no definite answers. And so we gather in community to seek in one another assurance and recognition compassion and strength. We gather in community to be reminded of what is most ultimate and what is most sacred in this spirit of searching and of reverence. Let us worship together this morning. Now I also get to read the kid's story, which is actually kind of a true story. The Christmas Mitzvah. Al Rosen was a Jewish man who loved Christmas. It wasn't his holiday. He had Hanukkah, the festival of lights. But what could be bad about peace on earth and goodwill to humanity? On Hanukkah night, that was also Christmas Eve, Al and his son Jonathan kindled their menorah and then walked through the neighborhood to admire the decorations. At Clarence's corner newsstand, the clerk shivered in the cold. Merry Christmas, Clarence. Why aren't you with your family? Boss wants me here till midnight. Al shook his head. His friend should not have to work on Christmas Eve. Go home. Let us finish your shift. Call it a Christmas mitzvah. A mitzvah? Jonathan explained. A mitzvah, a good deed, but also a commandment what God wants. Clarence nodded. I get it. Anyone can do a mitzvah. Even if the good Lord wants it, though, you two can't run a newsstand. Give God a hand, El said. Teach us. And the Rosens ran the newsstand for several Christmas Eves. But when Jonathan went away to college and Clarence moved on, Al had nothing to do on Christmas Eve. He called a radio station. The DJ put him on the air. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm Al Rosen. I'm Jewish. If you're a Christian and have to work tonight, 
but would rather be home with your family, I'll do your job for nothing. The switchboard lit up with red and green. <laughs> for 30 more years, Al did Christmas mitzvahs. He pumped gas, lugged bags, tended bar, spun records, and changed bedpans. Some jobs he did better than others. <laughs> Al bagged groceries, took tolls, sorted mail, filed papers, and parked cars. Jonathan became a doctor and moved back to town. Together, they mucked stalls, collected eggs, exercised dogs, fed cats, and scrubbed cages. Al became a grandfather when Jonathan married Beth and Sarah was born, then Ari and Zach. In wind, sleet, and chill, the Rosens bundled up to change tires, direct traffic, sweep sidewalks, deliver parcels, and plow snow. The mitzvahs became a local legend, bussing tables, peeling potatoes, pouring coffee, washing dishes, and mopping floors. Years piled up like drifts in a blizzard. Al grew gray and achy. Yet come Christmas Eve, he'd find his parka and head out into the night to guard gates, open doors, answer phones, do laundry, and shine shoes. Inspired by Al and Jonathan, Christian and Muslim friends did their jobs on the Jewish high holidays. The idea spread. People volunteered on each other's special days. Some jobs they did better than others. One Christmas Eve brought a bittersweet story on the local news. A Christmas miracle ends this snowy evening. 36 years ago tonight, a Jewish man took on the work of a newsstand clerk and sent the fellow home for the holiday. Al Rosen kept up that tradition for more than three decades, learning dozens of jobs to let strangers have the night off with their families. He says he's finally too old for the annual Christmas mitzvah. Al, if you're listening, thank you for a job well done and a life well lived, and happy Hanukkah. Jonathan's phone buzzed all day. There were whispered conversations. As dusk approached, Al decided there was too much snow to see the lights. Plus, he was too tired. We'll still need to light the menorah, Sarah said. As she was about to strike the match, the doorbell rang. Why don't you get it, Dad, Jonathan asked, and Al shuffled to the door. No one was there, but the driveway and the walkways were shoveled. A family of new snowmen grinned charcoal smiles, and a snowplow flashed yellow lights at the far end of a blue and white carpet. A banner hung from the plow, and it says, Al Rosen's Mitzvah Plow. <laughs> Out stepped Clarence, bundled against the cold, and a gas station attendant, bellhop, bartender, DJ, and nurse's aide. <laughs> Grocery bagger, toll taker, mail sorter, file clerk and babysitter, stable hand, egg farmer, dog walker, shelter aide, and lab tech, tire changer, traffic cop, sidewalk sweeper, delivery man, and snowplow driver. Bus boy, short order cook, waitress, dishwasher, and janitor, guard, doorman, receptionist, laundromat attendant, and shoeshine guy, plus their families, all the folks easy to dismiss in a world that mistakes wealth for worth. Now old himself, Clarence led the group. We want to thank you, Al, for the gift of Christmas. The snowball plow driver offered Al his keys. Come on, we've got streets to clear and decorations to see. Al stared out at a life well lived and wished he had one more mitzvah in him. He did. Come on, come in everyone, he called. It's Hanukkah. Let's light the menorah. Clarence looked puzzled. But we're not Jewish. 
Al laughed. You said it yourself. Clarence, anyone can do a mitzvah. Behind a picture window on a street of bright, brightly lit homes, a throng of God's children marveled at the shimmer of glowing candles. And now, even though we can't sing along, we can stand up if we want, and we listen to choir singing, we begin again in love. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. For each time that we have struck out in anger without just cause. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. For the selfishness which sets us apart and alone. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit. We forgive ourselves and each other. For losing sight of our unity. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separateness. So I see some kids waving at me eagerly for a chance because we're going to carry the flame back to our Sunday school classes. I think we're going to let Brooklyn do it this time. So we're going to light a, okay, we're going to light a chalice from our flame. And We'll sing our kids out. They're going to be getting ready for our big party after church today.
Um, one purpose of our religious community is to encourage all who gather to grow more generous in action and in spirit. This is the great end of the world's faith traditions, to bring the human being closer to divine acts of creation and compassion. We now take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will mutually support this self-supporting congregation and the shared plate recipient. Each month, Northwest shares 50% of the plate collections with the local 501c3 organization. The social justice and outreach team has selected the Michigan UU Social Justice Network as our December plate collection recipient. MUUSJN is a statewide network of activists from 24 UU congregations and fellowships and their friends who work together for social justice. If you would like to donate, you can do so in a variety of ways that are now visible on your screen. And we are passing a basket now for the collection here. That was the old video. Give me one second to load up the right one. My name is Randy Block. I'm a member of Northwest UU Church, and I'm the director of the Michigan Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Network. Many of you have supported our justice work over the years. I just wanted to appreciate this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what we've done over the last year and what our plans are for next year, and say how Northwest can be supportive of us during uh, 2023. Uh, our mission is to foster the worth and dignity of people by promoting social justice. Muschen is a statewide network of activists from 24 UU congregations and fellowships and their friends who work together for social justice. It was organized 20 years ago, becoming the second UU state action network in the country. Uh, 2022 has been a challenging but rewarding year for us. This year, Mostin mobilized 32 volunteers to collect 8,500 signatures to put voting and reproductive rights on the 2022 ballot. We responded to hate and violence through the, toward the LGBTQ communities and the BIPOC communities by educational forums and advocacy. And we worked in coalition uh, to work for a raise in the minimum wage, which will be on the ballot in 2024. Mustin phone banking reached 4,673 people, and with our text banking, we reached 560,000 Michigan residents, urging them to vote and to support reproductive justice. We've partnered with the UU The Vote, Michigan United, and an Interfaith Power and Light to work on these efforts, and we've published 37 action alerts to our statewide network on a variety of issues. During 2023, Northwest UU's plate collection will help Mustin to work on the following issues. Environmental justice, reproductive justice, helping people understand their voting rights, working to raise the incomes of low-income families, uh, working with UU congregations to challenge racism and promote racial equity, and continue to advocate for LGBTQ plus people. There are opportunities for people at Northwest to volunteer to work with us on these, uh, these goals. Uh, Moostin does action alerts uh, and will inform you and others how you can contact your elected officials over current justice policy issues. Volunteer opportunities can arise by participating in one of Moostin's advocacy groups, such as our Interfaith Reproductive Justice Coalition and our Environmental Justice Task Force. Volunteer opportunities will also arise out of a number of the issue advocacy projects that we'll be working on. So we're beginning to work with a statewide Native Justice Coalition to educate and advocate on behalf of Native Americans in our state. In short, though, I'm grateful to the members of Northwest UU for your support. Together, we can do great things.
hymn number 55, Dark of Winter. We build our congregational community by sharing our greatest joys and deepest sorrows. If you are attending by Zoom, please raise your hand either using the Zoom reactions or physically if you're on your camera. We'll start with the folks who are joining us online. Alex will acknowledge you and ask you to unmute yourself. I see Sherry. Oh, oh. there you go, Sherry. Um, a very special friend of mine is uh, not in good shape. Uh, Wednesday, she was given the option of to go home and die or have uh, Hail Mary type surgery on Thursday. As of this morning, she is still alive, but she's in a coma. Mm. So there's still hope, but it's not looking good. I'm sorry, Sherry, we'll let a candle... Randy, oh, go for it. Uh, I've got a, a, a concern and a joy. Uh, and so I'm gonna end on the joy part because I'm, it is very joyful. Uh, my concern is that my wife, Margaret, has been very sick all week with coughing. And there's a reason why the two of us are not there at church because we don't wanna share, share that concern with any of you. Uh, but I've, I've been lucky I have not had the a heavy coughing and so on, just a kind of a mild cold. But so what's new, right? Everybody has that. My joy is that um, my granddaughter, uh, Maggie, was uh, stopped over to our house here for about three or four hours because her parents had to do some other things. And so I really just took time away from all the work I do to just spend quality time with my granddaughter. And she's now running around, she's playing, I mean, she knocked, knocked me off my feet at, at how, how energetic she is and also how loving she is. So I just want to share that joy with you all. Oh, thank you, Randy. Is there anyone else online who has a joy or sorrow to share? Okay. This morning and you'd like to share a joy or a sorrow, you can just come back right up here to the mic. Yeah, I've been having wonderful holidays, being a dad for the first time in my life with two boys. We're getting ready for Christmas and work is insane because 
my wife AJ and I are also doing the annual gingerbread house project at the library. So we deliver these little bags with gingerbread house ingredients to families. And we had over a thousand children sign up this time. So we're gonna be spending the next week on the road delivering these out to houses. And our kids in the party have some of them to look at too. So you'll see the, the gingerbread houses being built by our children as well. It's a new record for us for the gingerbread houses and it's really fun work. <laughs> well, let us pause for a moment to honor the joys and sorrows that were spoken and those that we carry in our hearts. The reading this morning is What We Do Matters by Reverend Laura Horton Ludwig. Spirit of life and love, we are here because we believe what we do matters. We are here because we believe how we live our life matters. That with every act of kindness or meanness, courage or fear, love or hate, we are weaving the fabric of the universe that holds us all. We are here because we need encouragement, because we need strength, because so often we get distracted, we get in a rush, we don't think, we choose the easy way, when the harder path is what our spirits truly long for. We are here because none of us is perfect, because today we inspire one another to try again, to take another step. We are here because we have felt the stirrings of love and grace in our hearts and hands, and we crave more of that for ourselves, and not only for ourselves, for everyone. We are here because how we live matters. Blessed be. Looks like the top of my head is cut off on the monitor over there. That's better. I must have been 30 years old that long ago summer in eastern Tennessee. I was leading a group of high schoolers from Southfield on what we called a mission trip. We were serving as assistant counselors at a week-long camp for deaf children. Eric, one of my charges, was walking away from me towards the cabin exit. Wait, Eric. We'll leave in a minute. Wait. As Eric continued out the door, one of the regular counselors said, always one of the dumbest things I see, yelling at the back of a deaf child. This would not be the first or last time I would expect someone to do something they could not do. I learned a similar hard lesson while serving in a Korean Presbyterian church. I was puzzled by church members who had agreed to do something I asked of them during a meeting, and then they would not show up for what they agreed to do. It was only after a teenager explained to me what was going on culturally that I began to understand. He said that because of my status as a minister, none of the adults could bear to say no to any of my requests that I made of them. They found it more acceptable to agree and then not show up later. 
With that in mind, I changed how I asked for help to achieve more predictable results. I'm returning to a theme I touched on a few years ago. This theme is more about your attitudes than the other's actions. It's about choosing to see the actions of others in a way through rose-colored glasses. It's about choosing your sanity and well-being over the scripts that have, play, have been playing through our brains our entire lives. We have the choice to see the annoying, disturbing, maddening actions of others as nothing more than amusing diversions. Consider this from Roman Emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius. When you first rise in the morning, tell yourself, I will encounter busybodies, ingrates, egomaniacs, liars, the jealous, and cranks. They are all stricken with these afflictions because they don't know the difference between good and evil. Because I have understood the beauty of good and the ugliness of evil, I know that these wrongdoers are still akin to me and that none, none can har do me harm or implicate me in ugliness nor can I be angry at my relatives or hate them, for we are made for cooperation. Wow, in spite of all that craziness, we're made for cooperation. Marcus Aurelius was first and foremost a realist. He knew what people could be like as a civic administrator and a war general, he had to know what to expect from the people he ruled. He knew he'd be dealing with all kinds of human beings and, and human failings, but he set his expect, expectations both low and high. Low because he knew how most people lived with fear and did not understand their own limitations or their potential ability. High because he knew that humans were made for cooperation, despite the difficulty in achieving it. Aurelius understood that he might not have control over people and events, but he did have control over the way he perceived these same people and events. He wrote, when you're distressed by an, eternal, an external thing, it's not the thing itself that troubles you, but only your judgment of it. And you can wipe this out in a moment's notice. Hmm. You know, my father had an unproductive routine when my brother and I were young. Well, he had a few of them, but I'll talk about this one. Chris and I could be quite a handful, especially on a long ride in the family sedan. We were only two years apart, quite competitive and quarrelsome. We'd be driving along, a small squabble between the two of us would suddenly escalate to an argument, some mutual physical abuse, and then loud screams. After a few unheeded warnings from Dad, his long arm would suddenly whirl behind him, smacking each of us precisely on the side of the face. Inevitably followed by a short period of stunned silence and then loud wailing. Needless to say, my dad didn't have this stoicism thing down. He wasn't thinking, it's not the thing itself that troubles you, but only your judgment of it. No, he was thinking, this cacophony of wailing is most unpleasant. How can I shut it off as quickly as possible? So he'd say the worst thing to achieve this result. You better stop this racket or I'll really give you something to cry about. Our crying would predictably increase and usually mom would then have to start working on calming everyone down. Well, raising my own children was an early lesson in how little control I had over others. My fatal mistake, believing I had some power over things happening according to schedule. After my first year out of seminary, I had the opportunity to take a real vacation. We had a lot of time, four weeks, and not much money. So we planned a road trip that would include some tent camping and some visits hosted by others. The first lunch stop nearly defeated me. This was before Ben joined the family. 
the five of us, Bob, who was eight, Tiffany, four, and DA, three, filled up the back seat, and Mom and I sat in front. And then we filled up the back of the station wagon with suitcases and camping equipment and tons of supplies. We started late, of course, and it seemed the trip had hardly started when it was time to stop at Mickey D's for lunch. I'll spare you the details, but by the time we finished helping everyone with the bathrooms, ordering and serving food and cleaning up and then helping everyone with the bathrooms again, I looked at my watch and discovered our lunch stop had lasted two and a half hours. I despaired of ever reaching any of our destinations. It took me two weeks of the four before I began to accept that I couldn't force anything to be finished. I was at the mercy of my traveling companions. The key virtue I needed to practice at times like this, all the time really, was patience. And I'll have to tell you that patience was in short supply in those days. My traveling companions weren't too slow, you see. They were going as fast as they could. I was trying to go too quickly. Things went much better for all of us after that realization. The greater lesson I needed to learn was that it wasn't much, if any, different with adults. We think it should be, don't we? You'd think adults would be much more reasonable than children. No, not always. Adults have a way of hiding their motivations. A child will say, this is boring and I don't want to talk about it anymore. An adult will hide their true reasons and come up with something that sounds more reasonable. Perhaps we should start by creating a mission statement. <laughs> it is one thing to, uh, uh, too close. <laughs> it is one thing to work around a child's BS excuses, but some adults can really give you a run for the money. So, how did Marcus Aurelius deal with such self-deluding adults? He wrote, whenever you take offense at someone's wrongdoing, immediately turn to your own similar failings, such as seeing money as good, or pleasure, or a little fame, whatever form it takes. By thinking of this, you'll quickly forget your anger, considering also what compels them. For what else could they do? Can you believe he thought that? What else could they do after examining himself and all the follies that we follow? And he's in, he adds, or if you're able, remove their compulsion. Interesting. So Aurelius has broken this down in a way that preachers love, a three-point approach to better understanding each other, especially those we find difficult. First, Aurelius suggests that we can understand the other's wrongdoing by looking at our similar failings. Well, as you know, this takes a little humility to be able to look at yourself and realize that, you know, really you've got just as many issues as the other person that's driving you crazy. Do I value money, pleasure, or a little fame too much? I should be able to understand this person's motivations. Such self-insight might even give you helpful insight into what compels the other. I have a little trick I use to moderate my expectations of others. Consider the words responsible and irresponsible. Most commonly, we assume that responsibility is self-evident. Someone is in charge of a project, a chore, or some event leadership, they are responsible and will see that everything proceeds properly. I like to think about the words responsible and irresponsible a little differently. I don't want to know just who is responsible. I want to know if the responsible person is able to respond. If someone is not able to respond, why? Do they not have the confidence to accomplish this task? Do they lack the skills to respond? Is there something else that is keeping them from responding? When people do not meet your expectations, ask yourself, why isn't this person able to respond? 
What reasons might I have to find it, might I have to find it difficult to respond in this situation? See, we, we automatically go to, why won't they do what I'm asking them to do? Why won't they do that? Why, why, why? And the answer really is more, what is keeping them from doing that? What do they lack right now? What do they not understand? Is there some way of examining myself and my own motivations so that I can understand what might motivate them? Second, Aurelius suggests that we can reduce our aggravation, perhaps our anger, and increase our understanding by reflecting on ourselves, how we have and haven't been in a position to respond to the expectations of us. Now, most of us don't have any trouble remembering the times we haven't lived up to the expectations of others, so it should be pretty easy to mind, mind that uh, for a while. Such self-reflection stimulates compassion within. You may end up concluding that considering what they face, they're actually doing the best they can. Such self-reflection may even take us to the third step suggested by Aurelius, discovering an insight into why they feel compelled to do other than respond appropriately. We may face many challenges in the coming months as we still recover from the COVID public health disaster and our time without pastoral leadership. We have big tasks ahead of us. We depend on others while others depend on us to, do, to each do a part towards the success of this community. Mistakes have been made and will continue to be made. Some will be inherent in the process. Other mistakes will happen because we're not perfect. We're human. We're we're a pretty capable model, but always a work in progress. I encourage each of us to take the instructions of Marcus Aurelius to heart. Be easy on each other. Realize that everyone is doing the best that they can, even though that's not always good enough. Identify and empathize with each other. Look into yourselves and realize you have issues too. They may be similar or different from others, but our weaknesses are keys to understanding each other. Forgive yourself for doing the best you can. Forgive others for doing the best they can. Finally, in a quiet moment later, or when you sense your friend, your child, your partner, your lover is ready to hear more, share the small insight you gained from how their actions gave you insight about your own issues. Maybe it will help them too. Maybe not. Now the choir will lead us in singing hymn number 388, Dona Nobis Pachum.
Um, I feel like Peter just went home and wrote a sermon for me. <laughs> so for our chalice extinguishing, we're here from Reverend Katie Kandarian Morris. Here is the place to be forgiven. By extinguishing this flame, we pause as individuals and as a collective community to remember to regularly return to gratitude and joy, reminded that the work we do should be spiritually fulfilling. Spirit of life, spirit of love, spirit of generosity. As we draw near to that quiet, essential side of ourselves, may we open enough to consider the sacred choices we make. Each minute, each hour, each day that add up to a lifetime. Let us become aware that here is the place to be forgiven and to forgive ourselves for any past thoughts and actions. Here is a place to begin again with love. As we are forgiven, let us open our hearts to forgive others, to pray for them well-being and joy, that they be lifted from worry and burden into peace and abundance. May we all be blessed with riches of the spirit and moment upon moment of peace and serenity. Amen. This morning, we also have a special plate collection. 100% of this plate collection will go towards the Southfield Emergency Needs Fund to purchase gift cards to give to local Southfield families in need during the holiday season. And while Jim is passing the plate, I will go on with announcements. The first one is about holiday services. This year, the Northwest staff, along with Diana Kohler, will be leading the holiday services. Our multi-generational candlelight service will be on Sunday, next Sunday, December 18th at 6 p.m. Bring a sweet or finger food to share after the service. There will also be a morning service at 10.30 a.m. with Reverend Fred Wooden. The Christmas Eve service will be held on, what do you know, Christmas Eve at 8 p.m. <laughs> Both holiday services will be multi-platform. And on Christmas Day, Sunday, December 25th, will be a Zoom-only service led by Beata Lemparski. And for today's after-service activities, the youth programs will be hosting a holiday party in conjunction with the potluck. Join us for several activities, including decorating cookies, in the multi-purpose room. 